Andrea wants to know how to identify and navigate transference and countertransference in romantic and therapeutic settings. Well, I've had my fair share of clients falling madly in love with me and others who would want nothing more than to rip out my throat with their rageful hands so I know a thing or two about transference. And if you want to understand these very intensely charged moments in both therapy and in romance, then you're going to need to understand the psychology of transference and countertransference. For today's video, I'm going to be drawing upon the humanistic perspective of John Rowan, the neurobiological implicit relational awareness of Alan Shaw, and the somatic therapeutic embodied relationship transference perspective of the authentic movement practitioner. But these are all very theory heavy approaches, so let's start with a nice, short, concise introduction to the nature of transference and what it actually is. In a few sentences, transference is about projection and it's about taking emotions which are real but putting them into a situation which is disproportionately intense. So it's taking the real emotions of I feel really safe with you and I think I might be falling in love with you but then putting it way too extreme or the real emotions of there's something about you and I just cannot stand you and I want to tear you to shreds and then putting that into a therapeutic space. Transference before getting complex is really about a genuine emotion or a genuine emotional texture which has been put into the wrong container or is being experienced at a disproportionately dysregulated intensity. You don't need to go deep into the psychology of transference to realize that it's about projection and of course to project something means that something has to be genuinely existing inside of you. It's not the case in the classic Freudian circles of the earliest earlier 20th century that the client is merely mad or has gone way off the deep end in regards to falling madly in love with the salvational father figure who speaks from behind me because I'm sitting away from him and therefore I can fall in love with these omnipresent hyper patriarchal salvation fantasies. That was an issue in the setting of the early 20th century, but people like Carl Rogers coming in in the 1950s, 1960s, take an approach to transference which is way more human, which is an awareness, an understanding, and an actual willingness to relate one-to-one -one as a human with another human, because the therapist is also going to be full of projections and full of fantasy. But the difference in terms of healing outcome as opposed to chaotic roller coaster of a kind of therapeutic destruction where there's all kinds of completely inappropriate romantic situations or aggressive, combative, hyper traumatizing, re traumatizing situations, is the therapist's willingness and the client's willingness to acknowledge that something seems out of proportion. And then, crucially, to be able to discuss it. To be able to have an understanding that when these intense emotions arise, they're not going to grip you and take you for a journey that you have no control over, but you can dissolve it and say, ideally, if you were the client, you can say to your therapist, I'm noticing that I'm starting to develop a bit of a crush on you. Can we work through this in a way where we can try and find what's the deeper meaning of what's happening here? Because I've noticed in mentorships, if there's ever been a situation where someone starts to go towards that romantic space, if we can bring it out into the open as quickly as possible, and I can reflect back to them, what is it about this feeling of safety, and what is it about this feeling of connection, what is it about this quality of conversation that inspires these emotions of love, or affection, or romantic fantasy, we get into a really interesting conversation which is about their needs, and their wounding, rather than me as an individual. And some of the best moments within the therapeutic situation when I work with someone for four months is about the uncoupling from all of the projective identification and all of the potential validation seeking that could come with the romantic story. There are certain people who can understand quite quickly that it's not about me as an individual man. It's not about my energies as an individual set of energies. It's actually about the deeper need inside of them. And when we can bring that out into the open 
and I can genuinely step in and say, well, it looks like you need that from more of the men in your life. And then like, hmm, maybe I would like that from more of the men in my life. Maybe I would like to be able to be listened to. Maybe I would like to be able to express at my actual level of intelligence rather than always dumbing myself down. Maybe I would like a boyfriend or a partner or romantic, non-romantic male friends who can engage with a higher level of consciousness. And you seem to represent these things for me right now. The transference gets dissolved and it becomes human because you don't need to get hyper pathologizing. We're going to get into the psychology in a moment from these books, but you don't need to get wrapped up in the definitions and in this kind of intense cognitive space when you realize it's two humans having a connection. So both humans are always going to be present. You can't escape behind a mask of I'm the therapist. I have no emotions. I am merely a service provider and the client can't pretend in any degree that their humanness isn't going to be involved in any kind of therapeutic relationship because good therapy is about a good relationship. Carl Rogers' idea of unconditional positive regard, and if you unconditionally regard someone with positivity, doesn't mean unconditional love, but if you provide a safety and understanding, and you listen, and you're empathic, and you challenge them where appropriate, for most people, they've never received that before. They didn't have both parents in a healthy enough state where they were given that kind of energy, not only for just one session, but for months on end. Sometimes the therapist represents the first secure attachment of someone's life. And there's also not the pressure. This is, for example, in a situation with um, a normal romantic partner. With a normal romantic partner, there's a pressure, a healthy pressure, to meet the needs of each other because you're in a relationship where you're building as a duo, right? You're creating a partnership where it's mutual give and take. Within the therapeutic situation, there's a real flow of giving from the therapist to try and help them resolve certain healing challenges. And of course, the giving on the other end is the paying of the fee. The energy that the therapist pours in is returned via fee paying within a capitalistic arrangement. It's completely appropriate, but transference would try and place that new situation in an old dynamic. So, for example, for the man or woman who starts to fall in love with their therapist, they haven't usually got a point of reference. They don't usually have a point of reference of either a very good teacher, a very good therapist, um, or some other kind of coach or helper or healer who created that space of safety. So all of the unresolved emotional desires come up without the context to frame them around. It's almost as if the genuine feeling of, I love this person so much, they make me feel so safe, or I hate this person. I cannot believe that they would say that. I feel disvalidated. I feel re-traumatized. I feel like I'm being abused. I feel like I'm being manipulated. All of that comes through at such a sudden intensity without a nice lane of context of, oh, this is a therapeutic space and this is normal and I'm healing through it and some of this will be genuine and maybe my therapist does have this issue and actually maybe I should work through this or maybe they're not even the right match for me. That spaciousness is not available because the charge is so quick. So the projection launches like a projectile. Literally, you project, you projectile all of that energy in their direction. And of course, if the therapist isn't skilled, if they can't hold the space, if they can't hold the boundaries, if they can't pause and say, it seems like you were really angry um, in response to my um, accusation there. I apologize if I said that in a, in a harsh way. What did you receive? And they say, you just said that I'm a worthless piece of excrement. And maybe I was in the moment like, no, I, I said that you should really stop drinking. It's not suiting you. I didn't say that you were... I, do you see that, Ryan? Like, yeah, I know you literally said, like, to stop drinking, but the way that your eyes were looking made me feel as if I was a piece of excrement. I'm like, well, that's definitely not my intention. Would you like to explore that? And that's not how I'd necessarily handle it. It's a bit awkward trying to give a presentation, but it's something like creating the spaciousness where there was a quick jump towards a certain assumption or a certain outcome that is dealing with the transference situation. There's so many ways that we could take in. The fundamental idea 
before going into some of the deeper literature, is that transference is not an unreal phenomena. It's not something which is, well, to, in my opinion, based on where I lean, I do lean more humanistic, I lean more psychodynamic, I don't lean towards this idea that the transference place, um, transference, counter-transference interaction should be a permanent or even like multi-year regressive experience where you allow someone to go back into a prolonged childlike state where they're working things through that's a bit more towards hypnotherapy and it's not something that i offer or i'm comfortable with if that's what you need sure but i'm not going to be you know your imaginary daddy who's like here you go it's all okay or whatever you need and like it doesn't work for me the point is that something real is happening and if both of the people in the session can have the courage the confidence and the communicative safety to identify when something real is happening and the trust to work through it, that's some of the best therapy that you'll ever attend because you know that you're not being disvalidated and there's a genuine, consistent, actioned response where all emotions are allowed to come through. And if you're with a good therapist, they will notice with their attention, with their eyes, with their third eye sometimes, they're listening you know, behind the scenes, They'll see where things could do with a bit of a non-rational, a bit of a let's drop the conversation and see what's happening there kind of moment. Let's move into the second half of the video and go into a few different perspectives to complement some of the things that I've learned from mentorship because obviously I am but one person and I learn from teachers who know a lot more than me. So let's go to them. I think we should begin with the neurobiology approach of Alan Shaw. So this is talking about brain science, it's talking about implicit relationship, and if I can find the quote here, uh, we should be getting towards... Oh dear, I've lost a quote. Ah, there it is. Fantastic. It's a very highlight, heavily highlighted book in many page turns. So we're talking about transference and counter-transference from a brain-based, uh, neurochemical-based perspective, and this idea of an implicit relationship, which is that which is happening beneath the currents. I'm going to read from the book Alan Shaw's words from the science, at, the science of the art of psychotherapy. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, here we go. Excuse me. The discovery of the implicit memory has extended the concept of the unconscious and supports the hypothesis that this is where the emotional and affective, sometimes traumatic, pre-symbolic and pre-verbal experience of the primary mother infant relations are stored this is why i saved this stuff until the end of the video because we're getting proper on the terminology essentially it's the context of like what actually is the emotional texture that a projection gets formed around if you imagine a projection being a projectile that's firing out where's the swamp that it's coming from where is that emotion pulled the secret is in implicit memory these implicit procedural memories are expressed in transferential right brain to right brain nonverbal communications of fast acting, automatic, regulated, and especially dysregulated bodily based stressful emotional states. Transference has been described as an expression of the patient's implicit perceptions and implicit memories. Go a little bit longer, then we'll unpack it. Transference, counter-transference transactions thus represent non-conscious, non-verbal, right brain, mind, body communications. Facial indicators of transference are expressed in visual and auditory affective cues, quickly appraised from the therapist's face. This is the moment where maybe, for example, you were my client, let's say, and I say to you something confronting. Let's imagine that I say this. Let's imagine that I say, um... Tell me why, um, uh, it's just difficult, let's think of an example, I don't know. You didn't go to the gym or something for a whole week. It's like, can you tell me why you didn't go to the gym for the whole week? I tried to be as genuine as I could right there, but maybe you saw that me saying, can you tell me why you didn't go to the gym as a whole week, da, 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 was like, really intense. It's hard to pretend because... I'd calibrate for each individual person. So if I'm working with a more intense young man, you're like, dude, why didn't you go to the gym? If I'm working with someone who's going to the gym for a trauma-based reason of healing through, I might say it as, can you tell me why the gym didn't feel like a safe place this week? 
I calibrate towards what the person needs in terms of communication. But of course, sometimes I might be off in my communication and calibration. So I might, uh, you know, give the wrong response based on what would be appropriate. So you see implicit gesture and implicit energy that then, of course, could be taken to a very extreme end. We'll continue with the quote and then we'll unpack it. Countertransference, this is where we're going to, is similar, so countertransference being um, my transference I would give as someone who's therapeutically holding space um, to the client um, that I'm you know, working with. Countertransference is similarly currently defined in nonverbal implicit terms as the therapist's autonomic responses that are reactions on an unconscious level to nonverbal messages. In my, and this is where it gets really dense, so bear with me. In monitoring somatic counter-transferential responses, the empathic clinician's psychobiologically attuned right brain tracks at a pre-conscious level not only the arousal rhythms and flows of the patient's affective states, but also her own somatic counter-transferential interoceptive bodily based affective responses to the patient's implicit facial prosodic prosodic and gestural communications my goodness this book is incredibly valuable to read but incredibly difficult to read out loud the point is there are lots of wonderful literally correct technical terminologies that we could go into for the whole process i bring that in for anyone who's kind of uh, like yeah but what's the science about this that's the science about it if you want to read a 500 page book about the science of emotional regulation right brain to right brain left brain to right brain left brain to left brain patient to client friend to friend romance to romance then go for alan shaw and the neurobiology approach it's a useful book to read it's not something that i um think of you know i'm not literally in the session going hmm my right brain to right brain implicit procedural memory right now is indicating that the client is probably a little bit uncomfortable. Anyone who's got any basic level of empathic attunement is going to understand that the fact that the person just kind of aggressively blinked and folded their arms or leant back or then went silent all of a sudden means that they're not comfortable. And you said something which probably made them uncomfortable for one reason or another. We can then decide to what degree was that your ownership of you said it in a way which wasn't appropriate and to what degree was their emotional charge where it's nothing to do with either of you it's something that is needing healing let's go into countertransference. this is probably going to be quite a long video but i'm really trying to work from both the therapeutic perspective and also hopefully you can translate the lessons into romance as well because when we're looking at romantic territory we're definitely dealing with projection we're dealing with fantasy, we're de dealing with idealization, and of course, if you're going to put people as angels, it's very likely that they will become devils within just the snap of your fingers. So let's go into counter-transference in particular with John Rowan's incredible humanistic perspective. It's a really nice, much easier extract. This one, it's a nice list, and everyone loves a good list. So we've got here, signs of counter-transference feelings in the next few minutes are going to be particularly useful for anyone who works with clients because this is going to increase your skill set to be able to be a better helper. Having this awareness will literally make you a better, a better helper. But if you're not a therapeutic support giver in one form or another, it's still worth you listening to this and applying the perspective of, hmm, how could this make me better in conversation with friends, family, colleagues, and loved ones, or anything to do with your business as well? Countertransference is about our emotional self-regulation and capacity to correctly perceive what's going on and try and choose the best option. So let's go into that. From the book, Signs of Countertransference in Therapy. Number one, getting sleepy, not listening or paying attention or not hearing the client's messages. Number two, thinking, I feel all right about this topic and should feel upset, but I don't. Brackets, if there were no anxiety present, why would the counsellor even think about it? Number three, finding it difficult to shift positions or experiencing oneself tighten up. Number four, becoming sympathetic rather than empathetic. Overly emotional about a client's troubles. That's a really important one. When you start to notice that someone shares something which is really triggering for you as a therapist and you get 
the real response either matches with them or goes into opposition with them. Let's say, for example, you're someone who has um, a certain strong belief. I'm going to make it less charged so it's less political. Let's say, for example, you're a vegan and your client isn't a vegan. And every single time that the client mentions, oh, I went out for a steak last night with my boyfriend, you're like, do you understand how cruel that is? And like, <laughs> if, if that comes up in you, you really need to do a hell of a lot of work to be able to hold space because your own morals and your own values will get in the way in those kinds of moments. You don't need to discard them, but just having an awareness that everyone gets to make their own choices within reason, of course. I chose a less charged example. If someone's doing something highly illegal or highly destructive, you are very much within your right to have a sympathetic, suddenly dropped into experience, and then good therapy can sometimes mean, what are you doing? That's wrong. Because you might be the first person in their life, especially if they're a very successful person, who would be willing to speak up with that level of confidence and cut through their own nonsense. Let's go on to the list. Number five, counter transfer and sign. Selecting certain material to reflect or interpret and wondering afterwards why this material rather than some other material was interpreted. That's a good one there because it might show your avoidance. Say, so for example, you always avoid any talks around diet and fitness because you know in yourself you're not comfortable with diet and fitness conversations. It could be the same for romantic relationships. It could be the same for business. Actually, the classic one for the therapist is that they generally don't want to talk about business and money and finances and capitalism or anything regarding, you know, the very normal, healthy career building paths because they tend to avoid those topics themselves. They tend to be quite money avoidant or at least uh, not so business savvy. So it becomes a shadow territory within the relational space. Can occur. Continue through this list as quickly as I can. Pick out some good ones. Countertransference. Consistently interpreting or reflecting too soon or incorrectly. Consistently underestimating or missing the client's depth of feeling. Feeling an unreasoning dislike or attraction for the client. Getting angry at the client. Being unable to identify with the client. Over identifying with the client. Discovering a tendency to argue with the client, feeling that this is the best or the worst client, being preoccupied with the client in fantasy between sessions, being habitually late in starting interviews or running over the hour with certain clients. That's an interesting one because if you've ever worked with me, you know that usually I'm a minute or two late to sessions and also I tend to be a lot more open-ended at the end point for if you need 10-15 minutes, of course I'm going to give 10-15 minutes. Interesting, that's something I'm still working on. Of course, it works both ways. Me showing up slightly late and being less time-bound in that way also then means that you'll get more time from me at the end and, you know, works both ways. Something I'm definitely working on. We're all a work in progress. Being overly concerned about the confidential nature of the work, dreaming about the client, final two, being too busy to see the client or complaining of administrative duties. That's just straight-up avoidance. And number 20... Working excessively hard with clients to the point of fatigue and then complaining of overwork. As you can probably feel from the last four or five minutes of going through that list, there really is an entire world of potential counter-transference feelings. And if we were to wrap all of that together, really the number one guiding pattern for the therapist in session and out of session is... Am I doing things proportionally to what is appropriate right now? Am I giving them the right level of intensity? Maybe not enough, maybe too much. Am I giving them the right thought in terms of, for example, being in the session, completely present, completely present with the client. That's the aim. That's what's going to happen. But it's also completely appropriate that you think about your client in between sessions. Maybe if you've got the arrangement where they're allowed to contact you and you contact them between sessions, you might hold up a book like this book and say, hey, I think you'll benefit from this. And then you send them a photo of the book. Completely appropriate. If you're going for your morning walk or you're out with your children and you're thinking about the client's problems, probably some work to do on your end. The point is balance. And the point is really having just a healthy, grounded lifestyle where you can know when things have shifted one way or the other. Too much, too little, too hot, too cold, too intense, not intense enough. Finding the regulating point. Because it is your job as a good therapist and a good space holder, a good helper, just literally a good helper, to be the person who is temporarily within that agreement that the two of you have made 
the person who's temporarily stronger at holding the boundaries so your client can dissolve a little bit of all of that confusion, a little bit of all of that clinging and intensity, a little bit of all of that shame, and they know that they're safe and they're going to be held. Of course, by the end of the session, you want them to be put back together in a way which is then going to be able to you know, translate into everyday life. But the therapeutic space is genuinely a safe space, depending on the degree to which you hold the boundaries of the therapeutic territory. And that means you not only having a wonderful boundary of, I'm present with you, you've got my time, this is a consistent session, and you're going to get consistent listening, consistent guidance, depending on your style of therapy. I'm very much like, okay, we'll listen and work through, and if advice is wanted, I will give advice, um, because it's just human, right? Some people are completely against that, but I find that to be quite an avoidant, non-directive approach, and anyone who comes to work with me, for a variety of reasons, they'll come to work with me because they value what I'm going to say. So a whole variety of things I could talk about there. The point is, all counter-transference dynamics, they fall within the basic question of, am I doing what's right for this situation? And if you haven't done enough of your inner work as a therapist to know what is right, and what is wrong to have a clearly defined ego, a healthy connection with your spirituality, a felt engagement with your body, then you're not going to be able to really go too far into therapeutic space, and you're probably going to get quite poor results. So let's go to the final book, really hammering home this idea of uh, body awareness in particular. So how you can notice in a session where things are going a little bit off and bring it back to track. And then we'll start wrapping up this video. So this is from Authentic Movement, it's a series of essays, this is somatic therapy, it's dance therapy, it's not literally dance therapy, it's somewhere between dance therapy and Jungian active imagination. It's working with gesture in a way where you get to somatically complete the imaginal moment, the creative moment, and do trauma work all at the same time. Wonderful, wonderful series of essays in here. Hopefully I can quickly find the extract. I think we're going to find it just about... Really haven't got it. Maybe that's an indication that I shouldn't even go into it. I think I've lost it. I think I've actually lost the quote. Well, good news is I reread the book, so I don't need the quote directly. What I was going to share with you in particular was about the idea of the embodied relationship. You can buy the book for yourself if you want to. The idea of the embodied relationship is essentially the feeling of felt presence within the therapist, encouraging the feeling of felt presence within the client. It creates a sacred space of sorts where the client is given permission to shift their consciousness into somewhat of an altered state of awareness. This is different from the everyday conversation, not only in terms of when you're asked how are you doing and you say, yeah, I'm fine, not the literal conversational element of the everyday world, but the way that we notice our internal reactions to anything that's happening around us. So when the therapist asks, how are you doing today? I'd imagine, <laughs> unless you really are avoidant in your therapy, you're not going to say, yeah, I'm fine, you know, weather's nice. You're going to go to a deeper place where you're honest with your language. The embodied felt sense takes that a layer deeper. What we're getting to when we go into real implicit territory again, going on Alan Shaw's idea of implicit memory and implicit pr procedural action, is we're going beneath the conversation into the bodily-based reality. And sometimes the very best therapy can be when nothing's happening verbally. I've had incredible therapeutic breakthroughs with clients where I've made a point and I've said, hmm, it seems like you really are quite upset about this, or hmm, it seems like that really did matter to you, or hmm, it seems like that really is getting under your skin. And after 10 minutes of conversation of them denying that it was a thing, it suddenly smiles and laughter and like, you got me, I really do care about this. And then we both laugh for like 30 seconds straight, as if we we're playing this game of cat and mouse or hide and seek, where I'm trying to be like, no, actually, this is painful, let's, let's deal with it. And then the laughter itself clears out the energy that was blocked. Didn't need a conversation, it was just laughter. Or in another moment, I say, it seems like you're really upset about this. Half an hour of conversation. I do two hour sessions. I take a five minute break halfway between. Come back in after the break sometimes. It seems like you were really upset about this. What's really going on? Tears. 
Five minutes of tears. No words required. Were the words necessary to get to that point? Usually yes. Were the words necessary to go to the next stage? No. They become a burden. They become a blockage. The tears carry the emotion through. The laughter brings the emotion out. And sometimes it's angry. Sometimes you can play with it in a role play sense. If the therapist can properly be in touch with their body. And for me this will mean a moment where I'll be, say for example, listening to someone speak. And I'll get the idea in my mind of, hmm, there's tears there. Or I'll go, hmm, there's some anger there. Or their throat's starting to clench up. Or I can see heat coming on their chest. Or I can see the way that they're doing something with their hands. And I'll just cut through the conversation. It's kind of abrasive, but it also, it's usually quite spot on if you're attuned with your own body. I know, for example, when I feel a certain sinking in my chest, and I can feel a certain focusing in my eyes, it's a very particular thing to describe. When I feel a sinking in my chest, and when I feel a certain pressure in my eyes like this, I know that there's tears that need to be released. It's almost as if I empathically attune with their body in that moment, even through a screen. And if I'm courageous in that moment, I can say it seems like there's no more words, there's only tears. Sometimes tears. If I can notice when I start to get a bit combative, I start to get a bit, I can feel like I'm getting a bit tight because things are getting aggressive and someone's getting really aggressive. And I can match that energy and be like, look, what are you angry about? If you want to fight me, you can fight me. But I don't know where we're going with it. And like suddenly it comes in and it's a bit of a role play. It's a bit of a psychodrama, of course, intentionally done. If I missed the mark, I'll apologize instantly. You know, I was trying to get the emotion through. I apologize if that was miscalibrated. But very often, if I'm in touch with my body, I will know the signals in my body as it relates to the conversation. And I can bring through a moment that just abandons the whole conversational looping to get towards the felt moment which is really one of the principles of authentic movement and somatic therapy in general. It's going beneath and beyond the conversation. The transference is somatic. There's a somatic transference and counter-transference dynamic, which I should, have, I should have probably said about five minutes ago. That would be a much easier framing for all of this. The somatic counter-transference is me realizing as a therapist in that situation, my body has a certain response. It's likely based on the inner work that I've done for many years, that one of two or three things is happening. What do I think is the truest response? I'm going to take a little bit of a courageous risk. I think it's tears. I think it's anger. I think it's needing to get up. I think it's something, even if you're working, say, in, for example, very sexually charged space, and like, hey, this is like, what's going on right here? Is there an arousal pattern? To just play with that or bring that out of the shadows in a sense of like, yeah, I get that you're complaining about your boss, but you seem to also have a really big crush on him. And it's like, what? And then you see the blush and you're like, oh, yeah, that's what's actually going on, isn't it? And it's like, no. And you're playing with it like a good friend. There's so many, so many ways to go into that space because a true therapeutic relationship is dynamic and it involves the mind, the body, and the soul. And if you want to be a really good coach, a really good helper, a really good healer, you will be so clear in your system that you can offer something genuinely valuable to the person that you're trying to help. And if we can do that, all of us working together to try and help more people, we are going to see a much more healthy world. These are the books that I want you to read so you can get a deeper understanding of not only transference and counter-transference, um, Reality Game by Jan Rowan, I think that's the book, yes it is, The Science of the Art of Psychotherapy by Alan Shaw for the Brain Science and Authentic Movement Essay Collection. Long video. So much to talk about. I hope this has been useful because I could really make a whole series on this. I suppose it would be something like memoirs from a mentorship. Maybe I'll do that in the future. Who knows? But it's a bit of a taste of what happens behind closed doors. Difficult to put it in general terms. I've stumbled at times, but also the honest transference, counter-transference of you and me relating through this moment is that we'll never be exactly on the mark. We'll never properly understand someone else but if we can be willing to have the conversation if we can be willing to bring it into the open we might get a little bit closer to the truth of our identity and their identity as the river which is always flowing we're in change together we're in motion together and that communication ability that space of safety that encourages communication in the first place all of these things together will help us just to be better people in better relationships with the majority of people that we hopefully get to build beautiful experiences and memories with. 
I hope this video has been helpful. If you have any more questions on transference, counter transference, or psychology in general, even in a really niche way, leave it in the comments section. I'm making these videos twice per week and will be for at least another four years because that is the fate that I've chosen for myself. I'll prove it. The next video is over here. I made that one as well. There's going to be hundreds more, but that's the one that I want you to focus on. I'll see you over there.